Buenas noches, embajador Rafael Tobar y de Teresa, presidente del Consejo Nacional de la Cultura y las Artes, estimados amigos, a nombre de los amigos mexicanos de la Universidad de Verdad de Jerusalén y el Consejo Mexicano de Asuntos Internacionales, les doy la más cordial bienvenida a un evento muy especial. Los Amigos Mexicanos de la Universidad Hebrea de Jerusalén es una asociación creada hace más de 40 años para promover los vínculos académicos entre México y la máxima casa de estudios de Israel. La Universidad de Hebrea abrió sus aulas en 1925, 23 años antes del establecimiento del Estado de Israel. Su primera junta de gobernadores estaba integrada, entre otras personas, por Einstein, Freud y James Rochway. Hoy, la Universidad de Hebrea está considerada entre los mejores del mundo. Ocho premios Nobel han estado asociados a ella y es una fuente muy importante del progreso tecnológico del Israel contemporáneo. Yuval Harari es producto de esta universidad. Yuval Harari es un joven, pero muy destacado profesor de Historia de esta casa de estudios. Su libro, de animales a dioses, una breve historia de la humanidad, le ha dado la vuelta al mundo, ha sido traducido a más de 30 idiomas y no creo exagerar al afirmar que se ha convertido en una verdadera sensación. De animales a dioses figuró en prácticamente todas las listas de las lecturas obligadas del año pasado. Le agradecemos mucho al profesor Arani que haya aceptado venir a darnos el amante de miel de su libro en América Latina y que nos haya abierto una ventana en su apretada agenda antes de viajar a Estados Unidos, Canadá y Europa. Para la conferencia del día de hoy tenemos un panel de lujo: Leonardo Curcio, Javier García Diego y Antonio Lascano, tres destacados intelectuales mexicanos. Leonardo conducirá el evento y se encargará de presentar a Yuval a Javier y Antonio. Y aunque el Leonardo no requiere presentación, pues es conocido, pero sobre todo escuchado por todos ustedes, permítanme recordar brevemente algo de lo mucho que ha hecho. Leonardo es egresado de la licenciatura y maestría en Sociología Política por la Universidad de Provencia, Francia, estudios que realizó como becario del gobierno francés. Es doctor en Historia por la Universidad de Valencia, España. Y su desempeño profesional abarca tres campos, el del periodismo, la cátedra y la investigación científica. En el ámbito científico y académico es investigador titular de la UNAM, investigador nacional nivel 3, 2 del Sistema Nacional de Investigadores. Es autor de ocho libros, autor de 40 más y ha escrito más de 70 artículos científicos publicados en revistas especializadas. Entre los serios editoriales que han publicado su obra, están universidades de prestigio como la de California, Pittsburgh, Michigan, Valencia, la UNAM, la UAM, la Australian National University, Oxford University Press y Brooklyn's Institution, entre otras. Actualmente es conductor de la primera emisión de Enfoque en un programa de comunicaciones y es miembro del Consejo Consultivo y articulista del Diario de Universal. Es comentarista del programa de análisis político de Canal 11, primer plano, y participa en un TV como analista político. También participa en Proyecto 40 y en el programa Incursionando en el Canal del Congreso. Ha sido galardonado por el presidente de Italia con el premio de Italia del Mundo 2007 y la revista Líderes Mexicanos reconoció su trayectoria y lo colocó entre los 300 líderes más influyentes de México. Y también, y lo apreciamos muchísimo, es miembro de nuestra Junta Directiva en Comexi. Finalmente, quisiera agradecerle a Claudia Calvi y su equipo del Consejo Mexicano de Asuntos Internacionales por todo el trabajo para realizar este evento y, como siempre, a Pepe Cargal y Patricia Kelly del Club de Industriales que se sumaron, como siempre también, con gran entusiasmo y eficiencia a la organización de esta conferencia. Muchas gracias, Pepe. Muchas gracias, Patricia. Antes de darle la palabra a, a Leonardo y dejarme con los panelistas, Cristóbal Pera, director de Penguin y Rana, quisiera dar unas palabras. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Marina. Gracias a los industriales, a la organización que presides 
eh, a los panelistas que nos acompañan. Simplemente como director editorial, tengo un enojado de dar las gracias a, a, a Yuval por haber eh, eh, hecho el esfuerzo de venir a, a México a presentar el libro. En este caso, mencionar simplemente editorialmente, que editorialmente como anunciaba Jaime, ha sido un éxito eh, en, eh, en Europa. En Estados Unidos no se ha presentado todavía el libro. Curiosamente, el libro se ha publicado en inglés en Gran Bretaña, en gran parte de Europa, en España, ya en dos meses ha vendido pues, eh, más de 20.000 ejemplares, pero eh, es una primicia todavía más que un libro como este se presente aquí en México antes de su presentación por primera vez en Estados Unidos. De modo que eso es otro, otro motivo de, de orgullo y simplemente darles las gracias a todos ustedes por, por acompañarnos esta tarde. Gracias. Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Y para mí, por supuesto, un honor conocer este evento. El presidente de la Comisión de los de la Industrial es un honor y un placer que esté con nosotros. Bueno, yo quisiera decirles que me siento absolutamente agradecido por la vida, por haber leído el libro de Chubal, que el viernes lo tuve en el programa, tuve la fortuna de hacer una larga y muy sugerente entrevista. En consecuencia, no diré mucho más del libro mucho más de lo que ya dije en ese momento, además porque tenemos ponentes de, de tamaño, de calado, del doctor García Diego y del doctor Lascano, así es que no voy a rayarles ni un minuto más a la presentación, simplemente quisiera compartir con ustedes, que es un libro para quien no haya, digamos, todavía eh, abierto sus páginas o leído la contraportada, es un libro potente y sugerente, es un libro que te abre un montón de pues, ventanas sobre lo que ha sido la historia arranca en la física, así que la biología eh, continúa en un largo periodo por la historia y termina en la filosofía y la política porque hace una serie de preguntas, todas ellas bastante inquietantes por supuesto, como seres humanos, tenemos que hacer son preguntas pues de un calado enorme que no estará por supuesto compartiendo con ustedes así es que la mesa funcionará de la siguiente manera vamos a pedirle al autor que haga una presentación cinco o cuarenta minutos, posteriormente pediré a los comentaristas que hagan uso de la palabra y así funcionará. Yuval, escuchamos un mensaje. Back a hundred thousand years ago, 
we were like most other animals. We came in several varieties of humans. The most important thing to know, however, about all these different species of humans a hundred thousand years ago is that none of them was important. Again, we are used to thinking about ourselves as the apex of creation, as the most important animals, the most important creatures in the world, as if the entire world rotates around us. But this was not the case a hundred thousand years ago. Back then, if you took all the humans together from all the different species, you would find that there were less than one million of them. All the Neanderthals, the one Homo erectus, and so forth, all together, less than one million humans in the entire planet. That's less than a small neighborhood today in Mexico City. And the impact of these one million humans on the ecological system was very small. Not larger than the impact of woodpeckers, or jellyfish, or bumblebees. If we now fast forward a hundred thousand years to the present day, and a hundred thousand years is not a very long time in evolutionary terms, we find a completely different picture. All the other human species have disappeared. The Neanderthals, Homo erectus, and so forth disappeared probably because we exterminated them. So we are left now alone of the human family. However, we are no longer just a million insignificant humans. There are now seven billion of us. We are everywhere. And we are the most powerful force on the planet. We basically control life on planet Earth. And to realize just how extensive is our control, just look at a few numbers. If you ask yourself, who populates planet Earth today? If we look at the large animals, large creatures that populate our planet, who are they? By large animals, I don't mean, I mean let's discount all the ants and, and, and so forth, and focus on animals, say, from penguin upwards. Who are the large animals that populate our planet? Then we have the 7 billion Homo sapiens, which I just, just mentioned. And if you took all of us sapiens together, all the Mexicans and Israelis and Iranians and Japanese, and put us on a very large scale, you would find that we weigh about 300 million tons. There is 300 million tons of humanity on the planet. Who else populates the planet? Well, there are all the domesticated animals that we have enslaved to our own needs and desires and whose life, is, whose existence is completely controlled by us. The chickens, the cows, the pigs and so forth. If you take all of them together and put them on a large scale, you would find that they weigh about 700 million tons. So together, humans and the domesticated animals weigh about 1,000 million tons. Who else is on the planet? Well, if you open National Geographic on television, or you open a children's book of legends, you will probably get the impression that the planet is full of other large creatures, like lions and elephants and giraffes and crocodiles and dolphins and so forth. But these animals, they may populate our TV, they may populate our legends, our mythologies, our nightmares, but they are no longer there in actuality. If you take all the large wild animals remaining on the planet, all the elephants, all the whales, all the crocodiles, all the lions, and put them on a large scale, you will find that they weigh less than 100 million tons. It's less than 10% of the large animals of the planet. Again, to give just a few more numbers, if you think about, say, wolves, how many wolves are there today in Germany, the land of the big bad wolf and little red lightning? How many wolves remain there? The answer is less than 100. There are less than 100 wolves in Germany, and even those are mostly Polish wolves that stole over the border. In the, last few, in the last few years from Poland. In comparison, there are about 5 million domesticated dogs in Germany. 
Altogether in the entire world, there are about 200,000 wolves and 400 million domesticated dogs. How many giraffes are there? About 80,000. How many cows? About 1.5 billion. How many penguins are there? About 50 million. That sounds a lot, 50 million penguins. Until you compare that to chickens, there are 50 billion chickens. There was a thousand chickens for every penguin on the planet. So how did we reach from there to here? From being insignificant apes in a corner of Africa a hundred thousand years ago to being the dictators of planet Earth today? When we ask this question, and we often ask this question, we tend to look for the answer on the individual level. We tend to believe, we want to believe, that there is something special about us individually. That there is something special about me personally, about my body, about my brain, about my mind, that makes me such a superior creature in comparison with a chimpanzee or a giraffe or a pig or a dog. But the fact is that on the individual level, we are embarrassingly similar to chimpanzees. There is not much of a difference. And if you take, for example, me and you take a chimpanzee and you place us together on a lonely island and we had to struggle for survival to see who survived better, I would definitely place my bets on the chimpanzee, not on myself. And this is not something wrong with me personally. I guess if they took almost any one of you and placed you on the long island with a chimpanzee, the chimpanzee will do much better. So on the individual level, we are not such amazing and superior creatures. <coughs> Our power comes from the collective level. We control this planet, not because individually we are so superior, but because we are the only animal in the world that can cooperate flexibly in large numbers. There are other animals that can cooperate in large numbers, like the social insects, the bees, the ants. But the social insects, their cooperation is very rigid. It's not flexible. When a beehive faces a new danger or a new opportunity, the bees cannot reinvent, cannot change their social system overnight in order to cope better with the new conditions. The bees cannot say that and execute the queen and establish a republic of bees or a communist dictatorship of bees wherever bees of the whole world unite. Not possible. Because their DNA doesn't allow it. They're not programmed to live in communist dictatorships. So social insects cannot cooperate flexibly. Other social animals, like chimpanzees, like wolves, like dolphins, they can cooperate far more flexibly than bees and ants, but they do so only in small numbers. They cannot cooperate in large numbers. Fifty chimpanzees can cooperate very well, but five thousand chimpanzees cannot. The reason is that among chimpanzees, cooperation is based on intimate knowledge, on personal acquaintance. If I'm a chimpanzee, and you're a chimpanzee, and I want to cooperate with you, I must know you personally. What kind of chimpanzee are you? Are you a good chimpanzee? Are you an evil chimpanzee? Can I trust you? If I don't know you, how can I cooperate with you? This is why chimpanzees cannot cooperate in large numbers. Humans, in contrast, are the only animals that can combine both the abilities together. We can cooperate flexibly, even more flexibly than chimpanzees or dolphins, but we can do so in very large numbers. Thousands, millions, hundreds of millions of complete strangers can cooperate in politics, in economics, in religion, and so forth, to create very sophisticated networks of cooperation. And this is what gives us control of the world. Our ability to cooperate very flexibly in millions upon millions of strangers. Take even this very lecture that I'm giving now as an example. I don't know most of you who are sitting here listening to me. I don't know uh, the pilot who piloted the plane who brought me here from Israel a week ago. 
I don't know the people who invented this microphone and this camera and this computer and manufactured them and bought them and so forth. I don't know the people who wrote the books and the articles that I've read in preparation for this talk and from which I gathered the information that I'm not conveying to you. Even though I don't know any of these people and they don't know each other either, still, we all managed to cooperate to create this conference, this intellectual exchange of ideas. This is something only humans can do. Chimpanzees never do such a thing. You will never catch a chimpanzee going to the territory of some other group of chimpanzees to give a lecture about bananas or something with chimpanzees. That never happens. They communicate, of course, but only with members of their own group whom they know well, whom they know personally. Now, it should also be emphasized that I'm talking a lot about cooperation. But cooperation is not always nice. Not only the good things that humans do are based on large-scale cooperation. Also, all the terrible things that humans have been doing, still are doing, are also based on this flexible cooperation in large numbers. Prisons are systems of cooperation. Armies are systems of cooperation. Slaughterhouses, concentration camps, these are all examples of systems of cooperation. So cooperation in large numbers, for better and for worse, is what makes us, our species so successful, so powerful. This is what gave our species, the Homo sapiens, control of planet Earth. Now suppose I've managed to convince you that perhaps this is true, that humans control the planet because they can cooperate flexibly in large numbers. The next question that immediately pops up in the mind of an inquisitive person is what makes this possible? How come humans alone of all the animals are able to cooperate flexibly in large numbers? Something that chimpanzees or dolphins or ants cannot do. And the answer to this question, at least the answer that I have to, to, to try to give you, is our imagination. The thing that enables Homo sapiens to cooperate flexibly in large numbers is the unique human imagination. We are able to create fictions, to create fictional stories, and spread these stories around. And as long as everybody believes in the same fiction, they all obey the same laws, the same rules, and this is what makes possible cooperation between strangers. When many strangers all believe in the same story, they obey the same laws, and this is what makes it possible for them to cooperate. This is something that only humans can do. You can never convince a chimpanzee to do something for you by promising him that, look, if you do this, you know what will happen? After you die, you will go to chimpanzee heaven, and there you will receive lots and lots of bananas for your good deeds here on earth. So now go to the no chimpanzee will ever believe such a story. Which is why chimpanzees don't build cathedrals, don't build hospitals, don't go to crusades and jihads and so forth, because they don't believe such stories. Only Homo sapiens, alone of all the animals on the planet, only Homo sapiens can believe such stories. And this is why we control the world, whereas chimpanzees are locked up in zoos and research laboratories. Now, people find it perhaps acceptable that cooperation in the religious sphere or ideological sphere is based on such fictions, on such stories that people invent and spread around. But I would like to emphasize that this is true of all kinds of human cooperation, not only in the religious or ideological sphere. Take, for example, politics. In politics also we have myth, we have legends, we have fictions. Perhaps one of the most important fictions in, in politics is the nation or the state. Nations don't exist except in our own imagination. A mountain really exists. You can see it, you can touch it, you can even smell it, the smell of the mountain. A nation it doesn't have a smell, it doesn't have a touch, you cannot see it. 
Chimpanzees can see mountains, but they never saw the United States or Israel or Mexico. It's impossible because it's just a story in our own minds. Similarly, in the legal sphere, perhaps the most important legal fiction of our own era is human rights. Many of our legal systems all over the world, including international law, are based on this idea of human rights. But human rights are not a, an objective reality. They are not a biological reality. Biologically speaking, humans don't have rights. Just as chimpanzees or wolves or dolphins have no rights, take a human being, cut him open, you will find a heart, kidney, lungs, blood, neurons, hormones, all kinds of things like that. But you won't find any rights. The only place where you find rights is in the stories that we have invented and spread around. Similarly, in the economic sphere, Perhaps the most important and most successful story ever invented by humans is the story of money. What is money? Money too has no objective reality. You take this green piece of paper, the dollar bill, it has no objective value. You cannot eat it, you cannot drink it, you cannot do anything with it. But then come along these master storytellers. The chairman of the Federal Reserve or the President of the United States and they tell us a very convincing story. Look, you see this green piece of paper? It is worth 10 bananas. And if everybody believes this story, and currently everybody believes this story, then it works. As long as hundreds of millions of people all believe that this worthless piece of paper is worth 10 bananas, it enables us to create extremely sophisticated networks of economic cooperation. I can take this green piece of paper, go to somebody I've never met before, a complete stranger, give him this worthless piece of paper, and get bananas in return. This is something only humans can do. Try to give the chimpanzee, it won't work. Chimpanzees are willing to exchange things. I give you a banana, you give me a coconut, okay. But I give you a banana, you give me a piece of paper, what will I do with it? <laughs> only humans can do such things. And indeed, money is the most successful story ever told because I think it's the only story everybody believes. Not everybody believes in God. Not everybody believes in heaven. Not everybody believes in human rights. But everybody believes in money and in the dollar bill. Even take Osama bin Laden. He hated American politics and American religion and American culture, but he had no objection at all to American dollars. He was quite willing to accept as many of them as possible. Now, people may find it easy to accept this idea that human cooperation, or human society, and politics, and so forth, are based on fictions. When it comes to saying primitive societies thousands of years ago in some remote jungle, yes, maybe they came every month to dance around the campfire and told stories about ghosts and demons and ancestral spirits. And these stories cemented their social system and enabled them to cooperate. But we, no, we, we behave differently. We are far more rational. Our system is not based on fiction. But this is not true. This is not the case. What I would like to emphasize is that modern society in the 21st century is also based on fiction, just like the societies of some tribes in the Stone Age, thousands of years ago. The only difference is that the fictions that we tell are far more strange than the fiction told, fictions told by people thousands of years ago. Thousands of years ago, the shaman may have told tribe members that the big chief that now died, his spirit went to heaven and now he is looking at you from heaven and if you behave badly, he will punish you. This is a story that is relatively easy to understand. Maybe it's not true, but at least it's easy to understand it. What is special about our society today is that it is based on such strange stories that it is almost impossible to understand what they mean. And I would like to give an example of one such extremely strange story that is very, very important for our world today. This is the story of corporations. 
In the, in the economic sphere in the world today, perhaps the most important and powerful forces are not countries, are not people, but corporations. Like Google, or Microsoft, or General Motors, or Toyota, or whatever. So I will take as an example the corporation of Peugeot, the car manufacturer, just because I studied its history so I know more about it. And let's ask ourselves, what exactly is Peugeot? This corporation, this company. So, it's quite obvious that Peugeot, the company, is different from the vehicles that it manufactures. If you take all the Peugeot cars in the world and destroy them, it will not harm the company at all, just the opposite. It will be something very good for the company because there will now be more demand for new cars and if you produce many more cars, they make a lot of money. So the corporation is not its products, it's not the cars that Peugeot manufactures. Perhaps then, the corporation is uh, the factories or uh, the machinery. But again, the corporation is distinct from the factories and the machinery. Some big catastrophe may come, a war, an earthquake, whatever, and destroy all the factories and machinery of Peugeot Corporation. This will not destroy the corporation. It still exists. It still has offices. It still has a bank account. If it doesn't have enough money, it can take a loan from the bank and build new factories, buy new machinery. So the company is not the factories. Perhaps then the company is the workers who work in the factories, in the offices and so forth. But again, this is not the case. All the workers of Peugeot may come together in a union and go on strike, demanding higher wages. And the management will get very upset and says, we don't know who wants to give you uh, higher salaries. We are all fired. Go away. We are moving production to China. Those things are cheaper. It won't harm the company. Even if all the workers are dismissed simultaneously, the company continues to exist and simply hires new workers. Perhaps then the company's corporation is the management. But no, there is a clear distinction, legal distinction, between the company and the management. For example, if all the big managers of Peugeot go together in an airplane flying to China to sign this big important deal, and on the way the plane crashes and everybody is killed instantaneously. This will not harm, this will not destroy the company. The company continues to exist, even though all the management has been killed. It will simply hire new managers and continue with business as usual. Perhaps then the company is the stockbrokers, the people who own the stocks of the company. But again, this is not the case. You can sell all the stocks to somebody else, everything changes hand, the company itself, the corporation, continues to exist. So we see that Peugeot is none of these things. A corporation is not its products, it's not its factories, it's not its workers, managers, or even owners. It is something else, something distinct. What is it? It's a fiction, it's a story, it's a legal fiction. A legal fiction of a very unique, particular kind that people began to imagine, began to invent several hundred years ago. For most of history, there was no such thing as corporation, as limited liability companies. If you go back to the Middle Ages, you go, say, to France, you do find people producing vehicles. Like there is a workshop that produces uh, cars and other vehicles. But this workshop, it's not a company. It belongs to a person. Say, I own this workshop for, the, for producing cards and wagons. I am the business. This means that if I sell you a wagon and the wagon breaks down after one week and you are very upset, you go and you sue me personally. I'm liable for it because I'm the business. And if I don't have money to pay back for the, for the, for the broken card, then you can take something of my own. You can take my house or my field as compensation. Similarly, if I borrowed money, say I borrowed 1,000 gold coins 
in order to stop my business, to stop my workshop. And now business is slow, and I cannot repay the debt. What happens? What happens is that the people from whom I borrowed the money can sue me personally. And if I don't have a thousand gold coins to return, then they can take my house, they can take my chickens, my cows, my field. If it's not enough, they can take my children, sell them to slavery. If it's not enough to cover the one thousand gold coins, they can take me and sell me to slavery or send me to prison because I am 100% liable for all the debts incurred by my workshop. I'm the workshop. Now, this situation obviously was detrimental to economic activity and to economic entrepreneurship. People were afraid to take economic risks. People were afraid to start new businesses, to take loans in order to start all kinds of new businesses because the danger was enormous. If I fail, it means that I lose everything, my family loses everything, even our very liberty might be lost. And this was a situation for thousands of years until the early modern period. Some people in Europe, very clever people, lawyers maybe, they came up with an amazing story. They told people the following story. Look, suppose that we invent such a thing called a corporation, a limited liability company. And we say that the company is the business and not, and not me. And we say that the company takes loans and have to repay it, not the owners and not the managers. Wonderful. In such a situation, and the company, I establish a company, and now it is distinct for me. And the company takes on itself all the risks, not me. The company takes loans in order to start a new business. And let's say after a year or two years, uh, business is slow, it cannot repay the debt. And the bankers or the people from whom the money was borrowed, they come to me. And, I say, and they say, you borrowed the money, now give it back, or we take everything you own. And I'm protected. I say to them, no, 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 you're mistaken. It's not me who took your money. It's the company that took your money. So through the company, there is the company's assets. You can't touch me. It wasn't me who took your money. This was a wonderful invention because it encouraged economic entrepreneurship. People were now much more willing to take risks. If they wanted to do something risky, they simply established a company and the company took all the risks on its own head invented it, fictional it, because the company was just a fiction, it was just a story, it was just a make-believe. Let's imagine that there is such a thing as a company and it does everything. But we have gotten so used to this situation that companies run the economy that we forgot that this is just a story that we invented several hundred years ago. Now, how exactly do you establish a company? This is very important to go down to the small details and understand how exactly it is done. How do you create a fictional entity? And the answer is that you do it in exactly the same way that shamans and rabbis and priests and so forth have been creating ghosts and spirits and gods and angels and demons for thousands upon thousands of years. You tell a story and you convince everybody to believe the story, and then everybody behaves as if this story is true. This is how you create gods, and this is how you create corporations, and nations, and money, and so forth. Take, for example, maybe the most famous example of all of how to create God. The ceremony of Mass of the Eucharist in the Catholic Church, according to the story, to the dogma of the Catholic Church, if in some Sunday, during the ceremony of Mass, in church, the priest, dressed in his wonderful robes, takes a piece of bread and pronounces the magical words, hoc est corpus meo, this is my body. The moment the priest says these words, the bread turns into God, hocus pocus. This is actually the origin of the term hocus pocus. Because the medieval peasants who didn't know Latin, they heard the priest says hocus pocus, and it sounded to them like hocus pocus. 
So this was the origin of the idea that if you take something and say how it's focus, it turns into something else. And if you believe this, if you believe this story, then once you see the priest perform this ceremony, you start behaving as if God really exists, is really present in this piece of bread. And in exactly the same way, you create a corporation. You create a limited liability company. How did Armand Peugeot, the founder of Peugeot company, how did he create it? He went to a sacred place, to a magical place, the office of a lawyer, and there he asked the local shaman, the lawyer, to perform this wonderful ceremony, and the lawyer dressed in his wonderful robes, pronounced all kinds of oaths and all kinds of spells that nobody understands, in language nobody understands, except lawyers. And the lawyer told the story of the creation of the new company in Peugeot, and wrote this story on a wonderfully decorated piece of paper, so nobody could forget it. And the minute they affixed the signature at the bottom of this piece of paper, the Jo Corporation was born. And as long as everybody believes this story, it works. Everybody behaves as if there is indeed such a thing in the world, the Jo Corporation, and it can owe money, it can sue you in court, you can sue it in court, it's a legal entity, a legal fiction. Now, you may get the impression that doing such a thing is easy. It's easy to tell stories and convince people to believe them. But this is not the case. It's very, very difficult. The difficult thing is not to tell the story. This is easy. The difficult thing is to convince everybody to believe your story and to believe the same story. This is the great difficulty. And this is perhaps the main subject of history. What we study when we study history is how come particular stories about certain gods, certain nations, certain uh, uh, legal fictions like corporations, how come these stories spread around and everybody came to believe them and not other stories? This is the main subject of history. And it doesn't always work. Very often you manage to convince only some people to believe your story, not all people. And this is why people fight. We often think that we fight, like chimpanzees or wolves, that we humans fight over food, over territory, over resources. But this is not true. In most cases, we fight over stories. I come from Israel, so I know one thing or another about conflicts and wars. And when you look at the ongoing war between Israelis and Palestinians for decades and decades, what is it about? It's not about food. There is enough food between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean to feed everybody. There is no shortage of food. There is even no shortage of territory. Even though Israel is a quite crowded country, there is enough territory to build houses and hospitals and schools for everybody. The problem is, the reason they fight is that they have two distinct stories in their head, the Israelis and the Palestinians, and they cannot agree on one single story that everybody can share. The promise of peace is perhaps that some great storyteller would come along and create a new story that everybody can believe. This is, for example, what happened in Europe. If you go to Europe 70 years ago, 80 years ago, to the First or Second World War, Europeans were tearing each other to pieces, not over food. There was enough food in Europe in 1939, again, over stories. But over the last few decades, Europeans have managed to convince themselves in a new story, the story of Europe, of the European Union, of the European identity, and Frenchmen and Germans both came to believe the common story of Europe, so they stopped fighting. To conclude, we can say that Homo sapiens controls the world because we alone of all the animals live in a dual reality. Other animals, like chimpanzees, they live in an objective reality. 
a reality that consists of mountains and rivers and trees and lions and elephants and so forth. This is the reality of the chimpanzees. We humans, we also live in an objective reality. In our reality also, there are mountains and rivers and trees and chimpanzees and lions and elephants. But, on top of this objective reality, we have constructed a second layer of fictional reality. Reality which consists of stories of entities that are only in our mind, only in our imagination, entities like corporations, like nations, like gods. And the remarkable thing is that as history unfolded, the fictional reality became more and more powerful, more and more important, until we reach today, when the most powerful forces in the world are fictions. The very survival of chimpanzees and lions and trees and rivers depends today on the decisions and wishes of entities like the United States or Google or the World Bank. Entities that exist only in our imagination. Thank you.